Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Russell Hollins. I'm the head of the uh, ENT department, which, if you like Latin, is otolaryngology. You'll find afterwards that when Dr. Tenho stands up, he'll just say ophthalmology, and everybody knows what that means. And for some reason, this very similarly sized and small Latin word doesn't roll off the tongue as well, and people don't really understand what it means. So it basically means we take care of your ear, nose, and throat. Um, we used to be, so we would have previously been in the same department. If you go back about 50 or 60 years, it was EENT. And of course, then the technology around uh, care of the eyes started to get more and more complex, and it became its own specialty. Um, <coughs> This lovely picture of the guy down on the bottom. I, I have a bit of an interest in the history of medicine. Um, and so if we go back many, many years, ENT is the first specialty that ever existed. And it used to be called phrenology, <laughs> which is the diagnosis and treatment of uh, medical and psychiatric disorders based on the shape of your skull. And we would, you know, we would go see a phrenologist who would feel your skull and tell you why you were crazy. Um, or various other things. And so this was sort of their concept of disease. And, I, and, I, and if you go back, so this is sort of very middle ages. If you go, go back even further, a little later on, I'm going to talk about a, a version of medicine or a type of medicine that arose out of, out of a, a culture 5,000 years ago that we actually still use stuff from. So there's some really interesting stuff that goes on in, in medicine in general and specifically in EMT, which, which is not modern. And that's okay. Through phrenology, we could determine that this guy has a really severe case of cat scratch, and we can't help him. <laughs> He's not curable. <coughs> so what is ENT? Um, so in, in the very uh, technical sense, it's a specialty dealing with the disorders of the upper aerodigestive tract and the vestibulocochlear system, which, to, to put it a little bit more simply, we diagnose and manage diseases or disorders of the ears, the nose, the mouth, the larynx or voice box, the throat, as well as structures of the neck and face. So when I'm putting it really simply, I say that we deal with everything from the collarbones up, excluding the brain and the eyes, and sometimes we overlap with them as well. So we do a lot of stuff in a pretty small area. Who do we treat? Uh, we treat everyone. My record is 0 to 104. I'm hoping to beat that someday. And um, we get referrals from all over. A lot of our referrals come from the family medicine doctors. Um, we, we receive referrals, of course, from the emergency department, various degrees of urgency, and lots of other specialists send people our way. Who do we work with? Uh, we work with a bunch of other specialists in various varying ways, um, from anesthesiologists on a very regular basis in the operating room. Um, we, we talk about sharing the airway with them. So we are one of our spe one of our subspecialties is is airway problems. Um, we deal with respirologists and uh, allergists uh, quite frequently. With allergists, we share patients. There's a, there's a significant overlap there. Occasionally, we deal with neurosurgeons. There's various things that we see in both the nose and the ears that can have a uh, relationship to the brain in various ways. And of course, the ophthalmologists. Uh, uh, I deal with one of Dr. Uh, Dr. Tenho's colleagues, Dr. Kratke. Occasionally we share a patient. There'll be some overlap with problems from the sinuses that, that go into the space around the eye. And of course with the ER physicians and oncologists, there's a subspecialty of our discipline that deals with um, cancers of the, of the throat and neck. And we deal with a lot of allied health professionals. Um, and in our department, we are very fortunate at Hotel Du, our building uh, which we started using in the early 1980s, which used to be a library, the, the first Kingston Public Library. Um, still feels like that sometimes. And so it was, it was given to the hospital when they built the new public library downtown, and it was turned into the, the ENT clinic, but it's also the audiology clinic. So in our basement are a whole bunch of specialized booths where they do hearing <coughs> tests, uh, specialized hearing tests and sort of regular hearing tests. We do balance tests there. Um, and we have um, a, a dispensary for hearing aids, which is, there's lots of those, but there's one in our, in our clinic. Um, we have speech pathologists who are part of that same department, and they're just kind of down the hall towards the hospital from us, and speech pathologists deal with problems of the throat and voice. Uh, I think of them as sort of physiotherapists for the throat and voice, and a lot of nurses, and all kinds of other people in, in allied health professions. So we're, we're sort of part of a big team. 
So I thought I would go through, it was, I found it a bit challenging putting this talk together because I'm usually giving talks to medical students or, or doctors or you know, specialists of some kind. And there's a lot of technical language and a lot of really cool pictures that I have in my slide deck that are probably not appropriate for people who've just eaten lunch and who aren't doctors. <laughs> um, I can tell you about them uh, if you're interested, but they're, they're, they're maybe not the best for this setting. So it took me a, a while to sort of figure out, well, what do I talk about? Um, so I thought I'd go through some of the places, some of the things we deal with. And I'm going to spend the most time on the ears. Um, so this is, a, this is a cross section of what the ear looks like in anatomy. And there's, there's lots of different parts to the ear. There's, a, there's an outer part, which we see, and, and an ear canal. And there's a middle part, which is this little space behind the, what we call the eardrum. It's a very thin membrane that's about one centimeter across. And there's little bones in here. And then there's this thing here, which is the inner ear, these little channels which have fluid and nerve endings in them, which is where sound gets turned into nerve signals and where balance sensation is felt. And all that then connects to the brain. It also connects, there's a path here that connects to your nose called the eustachian tube, which has to do with popping the ear. So there's lots and lots of stuff going on in this really small area that's here in the side of your head and under your skull or through your skull. So it's a bit complicated. So one of the things we deal with really often is this. That's an ear canal. And this is a little teeny tiny piece of wax, which isn't doing anything to this patient. And this is when I often tell students, and sometimes patients, that most of the time when people come in with an ear wax problem, it's my problem. It's not your problem, because I have to see your eardrum. I can't tell you what's going on with your ear until I see the eardrum. And so we got to move this. We've got to get around it. And it, it's, it's often a source of frustration in, in going to the other end of the spectrum. And, and the children we see who get ear infection problems, if a child comes in who has an ear full of wax and has a diagnosis of six ear infections, I have to wonder, well, how do you know that? Because there's a bunch of wax in the way, and you can't see the eardrum. You've got to know that. So this is one end of what can happen. And of course, this is the other end. And this person has a hard time. <laughs> i to press the right button. This person has a hard time hearing. Not terribly hard, but a little bit hard, because they they've made their own earplug. And I mention this because this affects all ages, and it changes with time. So earwax actually isn't wax. It's dead skin. And it gets all mixed in with secretions from glands in the skin. And it turns into sort of this brownish thing. And, and a show of hands for people who use Q-tips. Come on, be honest. <laughs> and can I have anybody tell me why do you use Q-tips? I asked a bunch of medical students this that, that last week. So why do you use Q-tips? What's the most, what most, strongest reason why you use Q-tips? So these students, four separate groups, all said the same thing. It feels good. The other part is we were trained by our parents, often our moms, because the ear, it's yucky and it's got to be cleaned up. And you don't have to do anything about this. You, you should just leave this alone because if you put in a tamper in your ear, which is basically what a Q-tip is, you're going to just jam it in there and cause yourself problems, which I see all the time. One of the most common foreign bodies that I take out of the ear is the tip of a Q-tip. <laughs> so don't use Q-tips. And this is how I think of Q-tips. Okay? Um, Earwax does change. A lot, we change a lot as we age. And one of the things that changes is, is our, oftentimes we make less secretions, which is, a, which is an effect. The secretion diminishes, and it affects two things that I deal with a lot, the nose and the ear. So oftentimes it gets drier and more stuck, which is why I'm tending to have to clear wax out of ears in, in, in an older population than a younger population. It can happen to anybody, but it's certainly more frequent. And it becomes really difficult. And sometimes, especially around the use of hearing aids, because then you've got the impacted wax in the hearing aid. I don't know if you can see that. It says, the ringing in your ears, I think I can help. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is the main thing I thought I would talk about here, because it's, it's, uh, it's certainly very, very related to aging in a, in a lot of cases. And that is presbycusis, which is the technical term for hearing <coughs> loss related only to the process of aging. We also see a lot of what's called noise-induced hearing loss. And of course, if you have a fellow who comes in who worked for 30 years at DuPont, and now he's you know, in his mid-70s and his hearing's getting worse, well, he already had some hearing loss from the noise exposure, and now he's getting worse because his, his ears are getting older. And there's all kinds of other factors that can affect hearing, including things that might have happened as a kid with ear infections and so on. 
So the question is, what makes hearing loss so difficult? Does anybody have something to offer here? What, what is, makes hearing loss so difficult? What's that? You know all about it. What, why is it so hard? You can't hear anything. But what is it you can't hear? So, so there's two parts of hearing loss. There's the loss of volume and the loss of clarity. And if you're an engineer who deals with sound, you'll call it a signal-to-noise ratio. So the signal's my voice, and the noise is all these people banging plates around, which gets in the way. So if you've got really, really good hearing, you can suss out what's being said, even though there's kind of a band playing over here. As soon as you lose even a bit of hearing, that clarity diminishes, and that's the problem. It's not the volume. So people who are hard of hearing, unless they're really hard of hearing, don't actually need loudness. They need clarity, which is why we always talk about speaking face-to-face and not talking through kitchen walls and walking away halfway through conversations. So we deal with hearing loss, and our job is diagnosis. We sort of try to figure out why it's happened and then give you some understanding of what that means. But we're not the only people that take care of it, of course. The other thing that happens with hearing loss, a lot of people who lose hearing, strangely enough, get very sensitive to loud noises, which is really difficult, because the world's a very noisy place. And, and I've been doing this for a bunch of years, and I don't know how to make the world quieter. Um, and the last thing is tinnitus, which is also called tinnitus by some people. It doesn't matter. And it basically just means there's a noise in your ears and you don't know where it's coming from. And it's usually related to having lost hearing. And it can't be turned off. We can help with it, but it can't be turned off. So there's lots of things that we do to help people understand it. And very, very many people basically end up coping with it. And some of them we provide various therapies for. So we diagnose, we counsel, we treat if there's a disease that needs treating, a middle ear disease or infection problem, we treat that. Um, and then we have our audiologists who help, and they, deal, they, they prescribe hearing aids, and they help people with adjusting to their hearing aids. And hearing aids are, it's important to understand, so many people are frustrated with their hearing aids, and, and, I, and I try to make the point that what you're frustrated with is, with is your hearing's not very good. And the hearing aid's just a tool that makes things louder. But your hearing has diminished, and so there are circumstances where even with a hearing aid, it's going to be really difficult. So we have a really great team who helps to manage these problems. The other piece I talk about with the ears is vertigo and imbalance. So the inner ear has a balance organ that helps us to, to detect movement. And they can be affected by many different diseases. As we age, we have a risk of falls. And part of that is loss of balance function. So the percentage of risk of falls increases for each decade after we hit 65. And it's quite significant. So there's many, many different factors, and I'm not going to go into all of it in detail, but there is a, a imbalance of aging. It has to do with loss of inner ear function, loss of nerve function in the arms and legs, and effects of aging on the brain. And all of these things work together, so it's impossible to sort of say exactly which part is affecting this person. And, and for the most part, unfortunately, these, these losses are not recoverable, but it is possible to treat people, and we have a really great physiotherapy program at St. Mary's that does uh, essentially balance rehab. And it provides people with an opportunity to re regain strength in their balance system. <laughs> so there's, there's this joke I say um, about the nose. And there are those people who admit to picking their nose. And there are liars. <laughs> This is the anatomy of the nose, so it's a little complicated. There's all this stuff in here. There's these things on the wall of your nose called turbinates that filter and humidify the air that you're breathing. There's your sense of smell that's somewhere up in this area. There's a little space here, and that leads out into these things, which are the sinuses. And sinuses are problematic for some people. And this says, his snoring is just loud enough to mask my tinnitus. <laughs> Which I thought was really good because it combines two parts of my talk. So there's a couple of ways I think about the nose. The simplest way I think about it is it's a structure and it's a membrane. And so those two things can have problems. So structure problems in the nose usually mean obstruction. If the inside of your nose isn't straight, you're going to have a hard time breathing through one or both sides. Now, I, I normally treat this in younger people. You get a guy comes in, he's in a fight, his nose is bent, you go to fix it. Maybe they don't remember the fight. I see a number of patients now in middle age and older because they're being diagnosed with sleep apnea. And we now diagnose sleep apnea far more often than we used to. And that's partly because there's more testing, and it's partly because the technology has improved, so the treatment 
has improved and people are tolerating the use of these things called CPAP machines more. But if your nose is bent inside, you're going to have a hard time using your CPAP machine. So I now do a lot more nasal surgery to fix the pathway in the nose called a septoplasty on an older population. And it really helps because then they're able to use their CPAP machine. So fixing the nose, because the, the sleep apnea actually happens in the throat, it's not actually a nose problem, but the nose problem makes it worse. So we help them with getting on to their treatment for their other problems. The other problem with the nose is the membranes. And this is probably the most common thing that I see in an older population, is dryness. So going back to 5,000 years ago, this uh, Indian medicine was developed called Ayurvedic medicine. And they did a bunch of interesting things, cleansing rituals, which we don't need to get into. But one of them is the, is the neti pot. And this is not how it looks. This is a really nice advertisement. This lovely lady is sort of sitting there very peacefully in a blue sky. This is sort of what it more looks like. And, and it's messy. It's, it's, some people love it, and some people find it really unpleasant. And if you've got sort of various sinus and nose problems, this is really helpful. And it's not going to cure you, but it will help it feel better, and it will be have, have to be redone regularly. So we really like the neti pot, and it's 5,000 years old. Um, I just a, a note here, post-nasal drip is a really common complaint. It's not a diagnosis. It just means you feel stuff coming down from your nose. And unfortunately, one of the things that happen as we age, also as a result of other diseases, is the, the mucus discharge of the nose, which is normally about two liters a day, diminishes and gets thicker. So it sits there, and you feel it going down the back. And it really bothers people. So we try to give them tools like the neti pot and various various things to help them manage with it. We also see a lot of nosebleeds, which is unfortunately more common in the aging population, and oftentimes as a result of the dryness, but also because a lot of patients get put onto blood thinners for other valid reasons, but they can cause difficulty. So we try to help with that. Um, mouth and throat I won't go into very much. Uh, one of the other things, again, speaking of dryness, dry mouth problems are a, are a problem across all age groups, but it does seem to be more common in the older population. A difficult problem to treat, oftentimes resulting from dysfunction of saliva glands. And my colleagues, I have two colleagues who are cancer surgeons. So cancers of the mouth and throat and the voice box um, are more common uh, it, from the 60s onward. Um, they're almost invariably related to smoking uh, and uh, add in perhaps uh, drinking. And so it's certainly a very specific subset of people that are at risk for this, and we do screening and we, tr we do treatment for that. Hoarseness, uh, there is aging of the voice box, and people's voices will change with age. They all, you know, if there is a significant change in voice, we, we do like to see patients with that to ensure that there's nothing that's more serious going on. And then we have our lovely speech pathology colleagues who can provide therapy to help restore some function to voice. And that's my last slide. And my favorite cartoon. <laughs> Any questions before I hand over to Dr. Yes? Why does tinnitus come and go? Why do you sometimes have it in the or the two? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, for some people, it doesn't go. What very often happens is, the symptom is worse when you're paying attention to it, and it's worse when it's quiet. Um, it's possible that hearing is fluctuating. Hearing loss is not always just a steady state phenomenon, so it comes and goes a little bit in some people. That usually relates more to the middle ear part of the ear. So there's like a sort of plugging sensation, and you get some, some, some kind of sound in the ear. So tinnitus is definitely um, not the same for everybody. And also, people don't all cope with it the same way. I'm happy to talk more about it if people want to come ask questions after. Okay. Oh, yes. May I just say for a moment, I have a cochlear implant which completely changed my life. I have zero hearing in normal in total terms. Yeah. Uh, without belaboring the whole story. Uh, I lost very gradual for many years. And uh, Dr. Williams sent me to Ottawa some years ago for a cochlear implant. 
has an amazing device. Mm -hmm. And those of you who, for whom hearing aids don't work, and you have a severe hearing loss, uh, and qualify for an implant, I highly recommend you investigate. So, so that's fantastic. The cochlear implants are awesome. It's the bionic ear. They've been around for about 30 years now, and the technology just keeps getting better and better. We don't have a program here in Kingston. It's in three centers in Ontario, in Ottawa, London, and Toronto. Um, it's a, they're an amazing device. We use them in, in newborns and up to you know, any age, basically, for complete loss of hearing. Fantastic.